Yes, please. Uh, uh, this profile I call Paul C. Meyer and the Disappearing Delegate. Uh, again, I, I, you, you guys are, <laughs> uh -oh, I scared Nicole. <laughs> uh, you guys are uh, probably getting a little tired of me talking, talking about this now, but again, I'm just sharing some of the stuff I've come across that I thought might be interesting to other members. Um, it usually involves someone from, it's, they involve people from pad history, and I share a little bit about the pad history, but I also share some of their unrelated experience um, just to get across like we've been doing all weekend that everybody has their own story um, and all those stories together make up uh, sort of the overall pad story. So Paul Meyer uh, is uh, principally remembered uh, by File for Delta as a signer because he's one of those who signed the Articles of South Haven. He was a former Chief Justice of uh, the fraternity um, he has an amazing uh, pad, res or not just pad resume, actually. I say fraternity resume because he started as a Lambda Epsilon member. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to spend some time looking at both his uh, pad life and his personal life. So I'm going to share a little bit about his family background because I think that's, to me, important in understanding his story and, and some of the impact. Um, uh, Paul's father, Christian Meyer, was born in Germany in 1852. Uh, with his family, he emigrates to the United States in 1856. And his father makes a living making coffins, which I thought was interesting. But, but Christian uh, is very ambitious, very hardworking, um, and is looking to uh, make the most of the new world. Uh, he eventually attends Northwestern University Law School, graduates with the class of 1888, and enters public service. Uh, he has uh, this incredible career in public service. He uh, serves as a clerk for the police court. He serves as a member of the Illinois State Legislature, serves as an alderman for the city of Chicago, um, eventually serves on the, uh, the Board of Elections and on the Civil Service Commission. Um, so very much in the public eye, always in the newspapers, um, very proud uh, member of Chicago society. Um, Along the way, he married Elizabeth uh, Beardeman and has four children. Uh, Paul, who we'll talk about at length today, Frank, Elizabeth, and Bertha. Uh, both Paul and his younger brother, Frank, decide to pursue legal careers in their father's footsteps. Um, both of them end up being members of File Fidelso, but we'll talk more about Paul. So Paul decides to go to law school at Illinois College of Law, um, which is, uh, I think most of the people on, these, on the call right now probably know from my prior presentations, uh, is the home then of Story Chapter, which will later affiliate with uh, DePaul. And uh, Paul has a very illustrious career uh, with uh, Fraternity, um, which is, uh, he's initiated by the Joseph Story Chapter of Lambda Epsilon in October 1899. The chapter at this, at this stage is only about four months old. Uh, he serves as one of the chapter's delegates to the very first convention of Lambda Epsilon in December of 1899 and is elected uh, assistant convention secretary. Um, at that, uh, you know, now our uh, IEB officers also serve as officers of the convention. The justice is automatically chair, the marshal is automatically marshal, secretary is automatically secretary. Um, back in the day, the conventions elected uh, the people who would chair convention and take those officer positions. Um, he was a uh, justice of story chapter or chief justice as they were called then, uh, story chapter from 1900 to 1901. Uh, and he was delegate to both the second and third convention of Lambda Epsilon. Uh, as you know, the third convention of Lambda Epsilon was the final convention. And it was there that Lambda Epsilon was dissolved and the uh, articles of South Haven, which would eventually give birth to file Fidelsa uh, were uh, drafted and signed, and he is one of the signers of those articles. Um, I know uh, John had posted this picture of the original seven in the uh, Take the Pledge group not too long ago. Um, he's actually in this picture, he's one of these seven people uh, attending the convention. Um, this picture is actually from the f fourth convention, the first as file Fidelsa. Um, after the Articles of South Haven are signed, he's among this group of people that are meeting on almost a daily basis 
uh, to hammer out uh, constitution, bylaws, and plans for the new fraternity. Um, remember, it's our tradition to always be working on our governing docs and making the fraternity better in any way we can. Um, the follow-up meeting to that, uh, the signing of the Articles of South Haven was called the Meeting of the Fraternity at Large, which occurred on November 8th, 1902, the day we commemorate as Founders Day. Uh, and he also attended that meeting. Um, he served as a delegate to the Fourth Fraternity Convention, the first for PA Day. Uh, at that convention, he was uh, selected to serve on the National Council. Um, for the first few years of Phi Alpha Delta, the way it was set up, there was a National Council established that was made up of two, two members selected by each of the chapters of Phi Alpha Delta. And that National Council elected the fraternity of national officers from among its members. Um, and he was elected that first year as a vice chief justice for the fraternity. So what happens after this first convention? Remember, this is the 1903 convention. You see the picture here. Uh, Paul is one of the delegates, gets elected, gets selected for the National Council, get elect, gets elected by the National Council as chief vice justice and then immediately disappears. <laughs> um, this is an article from the paper. Um, Paul disappears on the, his way home from convention. He, uh, it's reported that uh, he takes a train down, back from convention to Chicago. Um, on the tra train, uh, somehow he runs into a woman he already knew. I think Paul might have been a little bit of a player and they were just being nice about it. Uh, they get back into the city. Uh, he uh, escorts this young woman from the train to her home before going to uh, board the L to go home. And he is not seen again after that for some time. So the family immediately fears that uh, he's been uh, attacked by burglars. Uh, uh, they fear that he's been murdered. Uh, search is made at the uh, by the police of local hotels. Um, just in case he was stay, he he just stopped because he couldn't make it home that night. Um, but uh, the family is sure that he's met with foul play, uh, and the police begin to investigate. And this is a big deal, not just because someone's disappeared, because remember his father Christian Meyer is very much in the public eye, uh, has been in Chicago and Illinois politics for many years, um, and uh, is still active. One interesting thing, all these uh, articles keep referring him to as a law student. Uh, he's actually been a lawyer for two years at this point. He was uh, admitted in 1901. Mm. So a little more time goes on. The next day, Paul's still missing. Uh, police are now searching hospitals, can't find him. Uh, foul play is suspected. Um, they, uh, they keep referring to this young woman, although not so far not by name that he uh, ran into on the train on the way back from convention. Uh, um, so now they continue evidence. So a few days later, they've now found no indication of foul play. There's no crime scene that they found. Um, there's no, uh, no evidence that uh, he hasn't shown up in any hospitals. There's been no police reports. Um, so now they're, uh, they're, see, they're talking actually, and, and they keep talking about his trip. This is the, the convention trip. So his father, Christian, gets a call from the proprietor of the Pistaki Inn near Fox Lake, and this is where the convention was held. So a file that also sort of gets a mention. The articles now say the convention of his college fraternity that he was attending. So... Uh, the uh, head, of the proprietor of the hotel calls Christian Meyer and says, you know, I think I overheard when he was leaving, he was talking about to some of the, some of his friends, which would be other Phi Alpha Delta members, uh, about uh, going on a hunting and fishing excursion. Um, so now the police are beginning to think, oh, he's alive and well, he's fine, there's been no foul play, um, that maybe he's just traveling with friends. Time goes on. Now he's been missing for three weeks. Um, his father, which you can imagine this is pretty embarrassing for, the, uh, for this uh, political leader, starts at placing personal ads in the newspaper 
um, that say, Paul Meyer, let me hear from you. Everything is forgiven, your father. So now the police suspect there was some kind of fight in the family between Paul and his father. And this is really where, uh, what prompted him uh, to disappear. Um, and of course, every article mentions, oh, son of Christian Meyer of the Civil Service Commission, blah, 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 blah. So three weeks have, three weeks have gone by. Um, now they're not thinking it's foul play. They're thinking he's voluntarily uh, exited for some reason. So uh, now, uh, again, the, the police are turning into investigating the disappearance, thinking there's some quarrel with the father. Um, they're, they're interviewing the father, asking, what do you mean by the personal uh, ads you're placing? Um, you know, you, you for, when you reported this to the police, we thought he'd been murdered, that his body was thrown in the lake, and that's why we couldn't find him. Um, but uh, the father says, no, I've always maintained he's alive. Um, and although I've not heard from him, I, I believe he's alive and he'll eventually come home. So finally, uh, uh, Paul Meyer's uh, father uh, says to the press, we've heard from Paul. We know where he is. Um, he's not in Dallas, Texas, which was one of the theories. Uh, we know where he is. He should be home with him this week and we'll make an explanation that'll satisfy the public as to his reasons for going. So he's apparently contacted his father, said he's coming back, and his father's gonna make him sort of give a story to explain his absence, to try and uh, let the press down uh, off, the, off his case. So what is the story that goes to the press when he finally returns home? After being gone for a month, uh, Paul says he, he, it was a matter of the heart. Uh, he was disappointed. Uh, he was disappointed in his affections for a young woman. Um, he didn't give the name of the young woman, um, but now the press are onto a story. So this doesn't satisfy them. They start investigating all the women that have been associated with Paul Meyer. So they interview the woman from the train, um, who now whose whose name is now in the paper. Uh, they uh, inter they try to get a hold of a couple other women. Uh, the woman from the train says uh, she had nothing to do with it, uh, is embarrassed by the whole idea. She says, I, I've, I've only known him for three weeks, and he never proposed to me. There was nothing to, to come of it. Oddly, now she's only known him for the few, the few, a few weeks. He was at Pistaki Bay for three weeks because he went there for vacation before convention started, and they took the train back together. So, again, it seems suspicious to me. But what do I know about matters of the heart? So in any case, uh, Paul's story is he, uh, he tried to propose to a young lady. He was rejected, uh, became traumatized from the rejection, uh, traveled for a while uh, to various places, and uh, he, it didn't even occur to him that anyone might be looking for him until while he was in Shreveport, Louisiana, he stumbled across a newspaper article uh, that mentioned his disappearance and the uh, suffering of his family trying to locate him. Uh, so uh, at this point, he is, this is when he contacts his family and, and returns home. So we never get to the real bottom of that. It certainly sounds to me like there was a family quarrel. Uh, I don't know if a woman was also involved, but uh, Paul, Paul eventually manages to find his way back to Chicago. Now remember, at this time, he's, uh, he's Vice Chief Justice of Fial Fidelsa, so one of the national heads of the fraternity. The, the national fraternity at that time was much smaller, uh, mostly in uh, Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, he attends the next convention in 1904, but this time he's not elected to the National Council. I can only speculate that it might be the fact that he disappeared for part of his first term and was a matter of uh, public ridicule and scandal in the newspaper, but I don't know. So this next term, he's not, uh, he's not elected to national office, um, but the person who is elected national treasurer resigns uh, before his term is expired, and the National Council appoints Paul to replace him. So they obviously felt he was still a good, uh, a good uh, bid for the, uh, for the national governance of file Fidelsa. He attends the sixth convention in 1905, and there, uh, the National Council is eliminated and the convention starts electing our officers. 
uh, and they elect Paul as Chief Justice for 1905 to 1906. Uh, it's at about, also about this time the uh, justices start serving as chairs of convention. So he also chaired the next convention in 1906. So you know Paul can't stay out of trouble very long. So uh, in 1907, Paul suddenly disappears for a second time. Uh, the newspaper articles again start to appear, but now they go into Paul's history of disappearance. So they rehash the complete uh, history of the month-long disappearance that had taken place uh, a couple years before, um, and that before moving on to the fact that he's disappeared. Now, here's an interesting thing for you. Um, his father, Christian, Lee has, uh, has resigned from the Civil Service Commission uh, and has made Paul a partner with him in a law office. So it's a Wednesday morning in uh, 1907. Uh, Paul leaves home to go to the office, never shows up at the office. And uh, his mother says, we have no idea where he is. Um, uh, I'm not aware of any heart affair that was bothering him at this time. Uh, we just don't know where he is. So the police begin again to investigate. Our disappearing delegate has disappeared once again. Um, so now there are, are pleas from his kin. One of his sisters is particularly active trying to find him. Um, she's uh, she's uh, forming search parties. Uh, she's, uh, she's trying to get uh, the police to take the investigation seriously. But the police are kind of saying, well, let's hold off. We think he'll probably just show up again unharmed and we won't waste a lot of time. Uh, but time continues to go on. Uh, no one can find our missing young lawyer, Paul, who disappeared, um, notwithstanding all the efforts of the relatives and police. Uh, and uh, Paul remains missing. So Paul, as it turns out, apparently is not happy with his life in, uh, in, at his father's uh, office and has moved at this time to Wisconsin. But he, uh, <laughs> he's relocated uh, without any word to his, of his family to uh, Wisconsin. He continues to be involved. Uh, before he leaves, uh, he signed off on the petition to charter a new alumni chapter in Chicago. Uh, in 1908, he's uh, elected to the position of Supreme Historian. Uh, which was a position created at that convention, and he occupies that that position for six terms from 1908 to 1914. Um, during that time, he publishes the Directory of the Fraternity, and he authors one of the first histories of the fraternity. Uh, in 1931, he returns home to Chicago. Uh, he forms a legal partnership with George Fink, uh, who's a member of Story Chapter and Campbell's Chapter, and who's another past uh, Supreme Justice of Fio Fidelza. And the two of them continue to practice together in the Chicago area. So our hope, right, because we believe in happy endings, is that this return, this return to Chicago meant he reconciled with his father, the family was all getting along together. Uh, but that's not the case because when his father passes away, uh, it's made a matter of the public record and reported in the newspapers. He's cut Paul out of his will, and only his only three of his daughters receive any money from the estate. So I guess Paul was not actually uh, reconciled with his father. Um, but over the notwithstanding his uh, let's say inability to confront hard situations. <laughs> Uh, without uh, incredible road, lengthy road trips, without telling anyone. Uh, Paul did do some amazing service for Fial Fidelsa during his life, uh, contributed both to the foundation of Lambda Epsilon and the foundation of Fial Fidelsa, uh, served in national office, wrote one of the first histories, continued to be involved with Fial Fidelsa for his entire life. Uh, and Paul appeared uh, as one of the guest speakers at the 1952 convention, which was our golden anniversary convention, with other surviving uh, charter members of File for Delta. Uh, here's a picture uh, from the reporter reporting on convention. 
um, which shows some of those founding members. Um, some of them you've heard me mention uh, already this weekend. I know John Brown's name has come up a few times. Um, there's uh, Paul on the far right uh, at the fraternity's golden anniversary convention. Uh, Paul is asked to speak about the history of the fraternity because he had been Supreme Historian for many years. Um, and he uh, addresses the convention with the other founders, shares stories about the fraternity's early history and early brothers. And he presents the fraternity with a lot of the historical records and photos that sort of make up the core of the history's fraternity collection right now. Um, so like those pictures from early conventions, those were all donated by Paul Meyer, including, again, for some unknown reason, many of our founding members riding around on donkeys. Uh, the, the minutes of Land Epsilon uh, come from Paul. Um, some like even, even weird stuff like financial uh, reimbursement requests uh, from members. Uh, all this stuff gets turned over to the fraternity at the, uh, at the 1952 convention. So sadly, uh, Brother Meyer doesn't live forever as none of us other than myself will. Uh, and at the ripe old age of 82, after 50 years as a Chicago attorney and over 50 years as a member of our fraternity, uh, uh, Paul passes away, uh, leaving behind his widow Gladys and two daughters. Um, but Paul had continued to be active with the Chicago alumni chapter uh, and with Phi Alpha Delta until his final passing in 1963, um, which I always have, notwithstanding any personal problems he may have suffered, I always have a, a great deal of respect and affirmation for people who continue to serve the fraternity for their entire life, um, because the fraternity is something I love, and I love the members who, uh, who love Phi Alpha Delta. So that is my pad story for this afternoon the story of Brother Paul Meyer of uh, Story Chapter, Lambda Epsilon and Phi Alpha Delta. Um, I just thought uh, some of his personal, uh, personal story was uh, something very interesting that we were, were unlikely to see in any official histories of the fraternity. So I wanted to take an opportunity to share that with you and uh, remind you all that uh, um, there's the story of Phi Alpha Delta and then there's all the individual stories of its members and how they uh, how they're involved, uh, not only with Phi Alpha Delta, but uh, with family and friends and society as a whole, um, which is sort of my theme for the weekend. Uh, and uh, for my next presentation later on tonight, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the PAD members and uh, their uh, involvement either directly or tangentially with uh, the rise of uh, the Chicago outfit in, uh, the 1920s and early 30s, um, because uh, as you know, by uh, by that period of time, File Fidel had been around in the Chicago legal community for 25 years. So we have lawyers and judges, lawyers on both sides um, that are involved with the uh, the war on organized crimes, uh, war on organized crime that took place then. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, some PAD members who may have been uh, involved in that struggle. And uh, hopefully that'll be appealing to some of you who are interested in uh, organized crime history and uh, will highlight the way that uh, File Fidelsa members continue to impact not only fraternity life, but uh, also uh, the society in which we live. Uh, so hopefully I'll see you all again in a few hours for that presentation. And if you have any questions about the presentation I've given now today or any of the others I've given, I'm happy to uh, do my best to answer them. If I don't know the questions, I'll commit to trying to find out for you. <laughs>